Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Welcome to the daily quiz. Before we begin today's discussion, first of all, let me wish you a very happy and prosperous new year. May your IAS dreams come true in 2024-2025. And also don't forget, tomorrow on the account of new year celebration, we won't be able to bring out the Hindu analysis and as well as the daily quiz. Then we are also offering one-on-one -on -one counseling to UPSC aspirants. If you want to know how to start your preparation, how to approach this examination, you can get in touch with our, with our counselors by providing your details in the Google form for which the link is provided in the pinned comment and in the description box below. Just share your contact details, our counselors will get in touch with you. So with this, let's take up the first question for today. Which amongst the following leads to increase in India's forex reserves? Indian tourists traveling abroad, Indian software exports, inward remittances from Indian diaspora, FDI investment into India, India's aid and loans to other countries. See, to answer the question, you should first understand the basics of what is forex reserves. Let's understand what do you mean by foreign exchange reserves and then we'll come back to the question and identify the right option. This topic is in news because today the Indian Express carries an important article under the economy section according to which India's forex reserves has increased to $620 billion. Forex reserves are essentially reserve assets that are held by the central bank. That is the RBI, the Reserve Bank of India. The RBI is the custodian of the foreign exchange reserves of the country. These reserve assets are held in foreign currencies. It could also include bonds, treasury bills or T-bills, government securities, GSEX, etc. It is comprised of foreign currency assets, including the major reserve currencies like the US dollar, the euro, pound sterling, even other major currencies like the Australian dollar, Japanese yen, etc. It could also include gold assets maintained by the RBI, the special drawing rights or SDR, which is the reserve currency with the IMF and the reserve tranche position, which is the reserve capital that RBI maintains with the IMF. A combination of these assets, a basket of these assets maintained by RBI constitutes the foreign exchange reserves of the country. Forex reserves are critical in order to maintain exchange rate stability especially when the Indian currency depreciates as compared to the US dollar, the RBI intervenes in the forex market and sells dollars in order to stabilize the Indian rupee. So forex reserves are always denominated in US dollars. The cumulative reserve assets held, it's always denominated in terms of US dollars. So if the article says India's forex reserves has increased to 620 billion, it's always in US dollars. Forex reserves also promote the image of the country. It is critical for foreign trade because it gives confidence to investors, other countries and exporters and importers that we can maintain our balance of payments position and we can fulfill our payment commitments and sustain our imports. So that is what you should understand about Forex reserves. So now based on this, what you can realize is that our Forex reserves will increase when there is an inflow of foreign currency into India. So based on this basic concept, let's look at these options again. Indian tourists traveling abroad will not bring foreign currency. Rather, they'll end up purchasing more foreign currency and spending it abroad. So our forex reserves will deplete because of Indian tourists who will spend the money abroad. So that is incorrect. Exports of any kind will add to our forex reserves. Any export will add to our balance of payments. It will bring in foreign reserves to the country. So definitely second one is correct. Inward remittances sent by the Indian diaspora, the Indian community abroad, the money they send back to their families in India brings remittances into the country, which also adds to the forex reserves of the country. Then FDI, foreign direct investment, which comes in, also adds to the forex reserves of the country. But fifth one is incorrect. The aid and loans we provide to other countries will not really add to the forex reserves. It could deplete or decrease the forex reserves. So you take out one and five, the correct answer would be option C, two, three and four only. 
Now let's look at question number two. Brent and West Texas Intermediate, which are frequently in news, what are they related to? Are they related to credit rating agencies? Or are they benchmark prices for oil in the global oil market? Are they stock indices in the US market? Or are they auditing financial reporting standards that are followed globally? The correct answer here is option B. The term Brent crude and WTI or West Texas Intermediate is very frequently mentioned in economy related articles. Articles dealing with oil prices will always mention these two benchmark prices, which is a benchmark for oil trade in the world. Let's understand why this topic is in news. The Indian Express carries an article which says that oil prices have shed by 10% in 2023 due to global economic turmoil caused by geopolitical conflicts. As you know, the Russia-Ukraine war, the war in West Asia, they have affected demand for oil. And even though oil production has been cut by OPEC and OPEC plus countries, in general, there is a weakening of demand for oil due to slowdown in economic growth as well. So as a result, the oil prices have gone down and the article mentions the benchmark prices that is Brent crude and West Texas Intermediate or WTI. Now I'll give you a small exercise. Please find out which are the member countries of OPEC and OPEC plus. OPEC and OPEC plus, it's a group of petroleum exporting nations. They function like a cartel and they alter production levels in order to artificially set oil prices to retain their profit margins. So find out the members of OPEC and OPEC plus and mention that in the comments below. Now Brent crude, which is a benchmark price for oil. It's a type of crude which is sourced from the Atlantic, particularly from the North Sea. It has become a benchmark for different types of crude oil, which is extracted from the North Atlantic region. And it's also traded as a index on the intercontinental exchange. The WTI, West Texas Intermediate, it's a grade of crude oil produced in the US and as a trading index, it is traded on the New York Mercantile Exchange. So these two are basic benchmark prices for oil prices in the world. Next question number three, Siddha traditional medicine originated in which part? Did it originate in Rajasthan, Tibet, or Tamil Nadu or Nepal. Siddha, you might have heard, it's a type of alternate traditional medicine. You would have heard about the term Ayush, the Ayush stream of medicine, which includes all your alternate traditional medicinal systems. Here A stands for Ayurveda, Y for Yoga, U for Yunani, S for Siddha and H for Homeopathy. So Siddha traditional medicine system originated in Southern India specifically in Tamil Nadu. Let's see why this topic is in news and let's understand few important details about Siddha. Today, there is a press release on the PIB website, according to which the Ministry of Ayush has marked and celebrated National Siddha Day. And the participants, they've encouraged the promotion of traditional Ayush-like systems essentially traditional alternate medicinal systems like Siddha. National Siddha Day is marked by the Ayush ministry to mark the birthday of Siddhar Agathyar, who is considered as the father of Siddha medicine. Usually it is marked in the last week of December or in the first week of January, according to the Tamil calendar, which marks the birth date of Siddhar Agathyar, the father of Siddha medicine. This traditional form of medicine is rooted in southern India, particularly in Tamil Nadu. All the inscriptions are in Tamil literature as well. And it mainly relies on herbal and animal compounds and inorganic compounds for treatment. It even uses sulfur and mercury to treat various diseases. This traditional medicinal system is also connected with Hindu mythology as well. It's believed that it originated from Lord Shiva, who taught the medical practices to Parvati and Nandi, and it was further propagated through the nine devatas. This is the mythological story behind it. 
but under Siddhar Agathiar and various Siddhar leaders of that era, Siddha medicine took root in Tamil Nadu and gained a lot of popularity across southern India. This traditional medicinal system remains quite popular even today, especially in rural parts of India, southern India, Siddha medicine remains very popular. But however, it remains equally controversial as well. Modern science-based allopathic medicine rejects alternate medicines like Siddha. It's rejected on the grounds that it is not rooted in science and allopathic practitioners even treat this as quackery. But however, the government of India promotes alternate traditional medicinal systems like Ayush. We have a dedicated ministry as well to promote the alternate medicinal systems. Even though there could be some quacks and even though there is a lack of professional scientific research, there are certain traditional systems which do bring medicinal value and, and may play a role in public health care. So the Indian government promotes Ayush research to bring back the genuineness of these traditional systems and we promote this as well through our soft power foreign policy as a cultural symbol from India. So this is what you should know about Siddha medicine. Now coming to the fourth question, the National Cooperative Dairy Federation of India promotes cooperative model of development for which industry? Is it for dairy industry, oil seeds, vegetable and edible oil or vanaspati? You have to select the correct answer. Now, most of you might think that National Cooperative Dairy Federation, as it is named, would obviously deal with promotion of dairy industry alone. But that is incorrect. Along with promotion of dairy industry, it also promotes all the other industries mentioned here. Oil seeds, vegetable and edible oil and even vanaspati. Correct answer is option D, 1, 2, 3 and 4. Now, why did we pick this question? We picked the question because there is a press release according to which Union Home Minister Amit Shah has laid the foundation stone for the new headquarters of National Cooperative Dairy Federation of India Limited. It's coming up near Gandhinagar in the Anand district, which is the milk capital of India. As you know, the white revolution led by Vargis Kurian and the cooperative dairy industry from Gujarat started out from the Anand district, especially near Vasi, the village of Vasi. So the headquarters of the National Cooperative Dairy Federation of India Limited has also been shifted here and a new headquarters is coming up here in the Anand district. So the foundation stone for this has been laid. Now this is very important because India today is the world's largest milk producer. 24% of the global milk production happens in India and we are also one of the largest consumers of milk in the, in the world. This guarantees food security as milk is highly nutritious, it also is a key export from India. There are various milk, milk based products that we export. It creates livelihood opportunities for millions of people, especially farmers supporting the animal husbandry industry. And this model that India has created, it's entirely built on the cooperative model, where you have these cooperative federations and societies that bring the farmers, the cooperative collectives and the distributors together to build this dairy industry of the country. So this federation not only focuses on dairy development, but it also focuses on the development of oil seed industry, vegetable and edible oil industry, and as well as the Vanaspati industry. It mainly promotes the cooperative model of development for all these commodities with primary focus being on dairy development. So the federation is registered as a cooperative society and its new headquarters is coming up in Anand in Gujarat. Now let's take up a prelims question from the 2023 prelims paper. This is a statement assertion or a assertion reasoning kind of question. Consider the following statements. Statement number one, India's public sector healthcare system largely focuses on curative care with limited preventive, promotive and rehabilitative care. Statement 2 says, under India's decentralized approach to healthcare delivery, the states are primarily responsible for organizing health services. So first we should check independently whether statement 1 and 2 are correct or incorrect. And then we need to check whether statement 2 is the correct explanation for statement 1. Now, if you evaluate statement 1, 
we can say that statement one is incorrect. Why? Because India's public health care system is not just focused on curative care. It does not limit preventive, promotive, rehabilitative care. That is incorrect. You look at our health care mission, such as Ayushman Bharat. It provides for comprehensive health care in the country with equal focus on curative health care and as well as preventive, promotive and rehabilitative health care. So that is why statement one becomes incorrect. Statement two is absolutely right. Because under the decentralized approach to healthcare, states definitely have a bigger responsibility, especially at the level of primary healthcare. When it comes to running primary healthcare centers, the states have a bigger responsibility. With regard to tertiary healthcare, where advanced facilities are needed, there the center also plays a direct role. But when it comes to decentralized primary healthcare delivery, it's the states which play the primary role. So statement two is absolutely right. So as a result, option D becomes the correct answer. Statement one is incorrect, but statement two is correct. Now, let's take a look at fact of the day. On the website of PIB, we had an update from the finance ministry. Union Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman has chaired a meeting with all the chairmen of public sector banks to review the health of India's banking system. So various key parameters and indicators of the banking system have been reviewed by the finance minister. And one focus area was the stressed assets and non-performing assets in the banking system. To resolve the stressed assets in the banking system, we have a dedicated institution called the National Asset Reconstruction Company Limited, which was recently established by the government of India. So finance minister has urged the banks, which have a controlling stake in the National Asset Reconstruction Company Limited, to focus more on asset reconstruction to resolve the issue of non-performing assets and stressed loans, which could adversely affect the banking system. So let's briefly talk about the National Asset Reconstruction Company Limited. This was established in 2021. It was a promise made in the union budget of 2021. As the government was dealing with a lot of stress factors in the banking system, there were high levels of non-performing assets and stressed loans. The government announced in the union budget of 2021 that an asset reconstruction company will be established to dedicatedly deal with the bad assets present in the banking system. Accordingly, two entities were established, a National Asset Reconstruction Company Limited and India Debt Resolution Company Limited. The National Asset Reconstruction Company has been set up under the Companies Act and it is owned by the banks of India. The public sector banks, they own majority stake. They own 51% stake in the asset reconstruction company with rest of the stake held by the private banks in the country. And what is the role of the national asset reconstruction company? Its role is to take over the bad loans. That is why it is also referred to as the bad bank of India. It has applied for the required licenses with the RBI. It's registered under the Companies Act and it functions as the bad bank of the country, meaning whatever loans have gone bad, where the borrowers are not able to repay, those stressed loans, non-performing assets, they're all taken over by this company. They're all transferred by the public sector banks into the control of the National Asset Reconstruction Company Limited, which will later bring in experts who have experience in dealing with such bad assets, they will restructure that loan and they will try to liquidate these bad assets in order to maintain the health and stability of the banking system. To ensure that the bad assets do not affect the overall stability of the banking system. On the other hand, India Debt Resolution Company, it mainly manages the asset and brings professionals who have experience in turning around bad assets they are brought on board in this company to work towards restructuring of loans to ensure that the bad loans are restructured and thus the integrity, the stability of the banking system is maintained. So India Debt Resolution Company Limited is primarily owned by the private banks in India. They have 51% stake with 49% stake maintained by the public sector banks. So both these asset reconstruction entities are owned by the banks of India. Public sector banks have a majority stake in National Asset Reconstruction Company Private banks have a majority stake in India Debt Resolution Company. 
So these are the important topics for today. With this, I would like to bring the daily quiz to an end. Before we conclude, don't forget, we are offering one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions for UPSC aspirants. If you're interested, you can get in touch with our counselors by just sharing your details in the Google form for which the link is provided in the description box and in the pinned comment. Just share your details, our counselors will get back in touch with you. I hope you guys have liked today's session. Do let me know how it went in the comments. Press the like button and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. That is it for today. Thanks for watching. A very happy and prosperous new year.